Great. We got everything queued up. So hello, everyone. My name is Eva Lark. I'm the Senior Manager of Public Programs for the Seabird Institute, Hog Island Audubon Camp, uh, located in Midcoast, Maine. Uh, welcome to our Making Bird Connections lecture series, where we bring a bird-focused presentation right to your home. These presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help fun more programs like this. Uh, all donations go to fun Hog Island Audubon Camp Operations. I'll put a link in the chat or the comment section down below. No donation is too small, and it helps us provide free programming. Uh, tonight, we're proud to have our very own Maeve Cosgrove to talk about Audubon's live bird cams. Uh, Maeve was our 2022 Communications and Outreach Assistant at the Seabird Institute where she provided interpretation about our live bird cams on the explore.org platform. Currently, Maeve is an environmental steward with the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. We are so excited that you're back with us, Maeve, tonight to talk about bird cams. I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks so much for having me tonight, Eva. Um, I'm so excited to talk about my favorite topic, um, which is bird live cams, and specifically the cameras hosted on explore.org showcasing the beautiful birds that the Seabird Institute is working to protect. Um, this here on the screen right now is a picture of the boathouse camera at Hog Island Audubon Camp. Um, for anyone who's been to Hog Island, um, this osprey nest sits directly atop the boathouse where you left the mainland and began your island journey for your educational session. Um, this is actually two of the fledglings that were successfully raised um, in last season's nest. And I'll be showcasing some of my favorite clips from the season throughout tonight's presentation. Um, but just to introduce myself, um, as Eva said last year, I was the communications and education outreach assistant at the Seabird Institute. This was actually um, last summer was the first year that the Seabird Institute was able to bring on a designated staff member to facilitate the explore.org cameras. Um, in the past, these cameras have been moderated by volunteers primarily. Um, but explore.org is the largest network of live nature cameras in the world, and they've provided over $69 million of funding um, to 300 plus nonprofits worldwide, all focused on really important conservation work. Um, and this year, right now, presently, I'm in an AmeriCorps program called Maine Conservation Corps, which is um, facilitated through the Maine Department of Conservation, Forestry, and Agriculture. I'm about a quarter of the way through that program. Um, I was brought on board to a land trust here in Camden, Maine, in the mid coast uh, to facilitate a program called Learning Landscapes, which protects land attached to K through 12 schools and creates outdoor classroom and then provides support for educators who want to bring their students outside and create connections with the natural environment and wildlife. And I'll be talking about how bird life cameras actually later in the presentation have come up in my work uh, with schools here in the mid coast and how they can serve as an awesome educational tool. Um, I'll also be talking about the way that these cameras bolster research being done by scientists, like the ones who come on board every year at the Seabird Institute. On the left here is a picture of me and my fellow seasonal educator from last year, Arden Kelly. Um, we're holding a decoy, one of the original decoys that was used to restore puffins to Eastern Egg Rock um, starting in 1973. Um, we're at the Project Puffin Visitor Center in Rockland, um, where we are providing education um, an interpretation about the beautiful birds that the project works to protect and restore. Um, and Arden was a researcher at McGill where her research focused on prey availability for puffins, which is the biggest concern for these birds as the effects of climate change become increasingly more severe. I'll be talking about the way that cameras allow us unprecedented access to that behavior. Um, it can capture all kinds of cool data in a non-invasive way. This though um, is a really cool clip to start out with. This was the most popular clip that I posted to a YouTube channel I created last summer to post highlights um, from the season from the various cameras that explore.org hosts for the Seabird Institute. Um, there's three really cute bobbly head, wobbly little guys there. Those are the chicks that were successfully raised in the boathouse nest um, last season. It was the first year that chicks were successfully hatched and then fledged in the boathouse nest. Dory and Skiff were the ospreys who hatched these little guys. Um, they live atop the boathouse. So the fact that they are nautically named is only fitting. Um, and every year we host a naming contest 
for folks to submit their name suggestions for the chicks um, that are hopefully raised in these nests. It's a really cool way to engage CAM viewers. I feel like the way that most people know about explore.org is through Fat Bear Week. Um, Fat Bear Week is a contest that explore.org hosts with their grizzly bear cameras in Alaska, where viewers can try to guess which bear will become the chunkiest before hibernation. It's super fun. Um, it's a really cool way for people to get involved with the wildlife um, and with the cameras. Um, and the way that the Seabird Institute has kind of fostered that kind of communication between CAM viewers um, and staff is through these naming contests. Um, so this year we received almost a hundred responses for what to name the chicks. Um, Schooner, Sloop, and Skipjack are all nautical terms. I think the band of babies being all S names was very popular with the Hog Island staff who sifted through the name suggestions um, and selected their favorites. But just to get an overview of all of the awesome cameras facilitated by explore.org um, showcasing the beautiful birds protected by the Secret Institute, um, there are two locations where these cameras are hosted. Um, and that's Hog Island Audubon Camp. There is one camera on the mainland showcasing that beautiful boathouse nest seen again here. Um, and then there's two additional cameras that showcase an additional osprey nest that's actually on Hog Island. That camera has been active since 2012, um, which is super cool. Um, over a decade of unprecedented access to really cool bird behaviors on explore.org. And then the second set of cameras are on Seal Island National Wildlife Refuge. This is one of the seven seabird nesting islands that's been managed by Project Puffin um, and stewarded by researchers for the past half century. Um, and that camera contains three external views of the island. And then there's a camera inside of an Atlantic Puffin burrow and one inside of a Black Guillemot burrow as well. Um, and this is a view of the island. Researchers call her the granite slab. She's a snake shaped one mile long rock in Penobscot Bay. This is a map of the Seabird Institute's reach. You can see Hog Island um, in Muscungus Bay, um, looking out at Eastern Egg Rock, which is the first restored seabird colony in the world. No big deal. Um, the project is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary this summer, which is super special and so amazing. I'll be talking about some of the ways that we do outreach with the explore.org cameras at the Visitor Center in Rockland, where I had the privilege of spending a chunk of my summer last year, um, getting to engage folks every single day um, with the cameras on two awesome live screens. Um, yeah. I wanted to take a close look at each camera um, and what makes them so special and then highlight the ways that these cameras can connect um, people to wildlife and then bolster research efforts. So we're talking about the Bowhouse Cam, which I've already been doing quite a bit, but it was such an exciting season this past year. Um, Longtime viewers of the Osprey Cams know that there's been quite a few challenges in years past um, with predation issues from owls, eagles. There's been issues with wasps um, and some of the baby birds. These cameras give us a full view into what the birds are doing and all the challenges that they face. Um, so it's not always such a successful season as it was this past year. Um, but this past season, I especially felt very lucky as it was my first season with the Seaward Institute um, that things did go so well. And I like this picture because um, this is Dory, the female osprey sitting in the nest here atop the boathouse. And then on this pole at the end of the dock is Skiff, her mate. Um, this poll was slightly off camera. Um, for those who have tuned into the explore.org cameras before, um, the Osprey cameras capture beautiful views of Hog Island and Muscungus Bay. If you visited Hog Island before, um, or if like myself, you have very fond memories of the Todd Wildlife Sanctuary, um, it's really cool to log on and just enjoy the landscape. But this pole um, is obscured by the views that the cameras capture. And so a lot of times when Dory would go off to forage to get fish for herself or for her little ones um, and leave the chicks or the eggs unattended, cam viewers would write in and be concerned and say that the nest was empty. Um, and so I would provide pictures like this to show that Skiff was there, um, being very vocal to those of us patroning the trails. Um, this platform was erected on top of the boathouse in 2015 by participants um, in the Seabird 
or the main island service week session at Hog Island Audubon Camp. This is Eric Snyder, the facilities manager at Hog Island um, with participants who helped erect the platform. And then the camera went live in 2016. Um, so from 2016 to 2021, the camera was live, but there was no, um, there were no chicks that were successfully raised until this past summer. So it was definitely an exciting time for longtime cam viewers um, and Hog Island staff as well to be able to celebrate in the success. Um, this is another look at the cameras. The cameras are super high definition. They don't swivel quite 360, but they provide really cool panoramic views. Um, like I mentioned of Muscungus Bay and the island and the wildlife sanctuary. These cameras don't just capture what the ospreys are doing, but capture a lot of different wildlife sightings um, that are going on in the area. And I'll be highlighting some of those in a moment. Um, but as you can see, these are the three chicks. They're getting pretty close to fledging here. Um, and they're with Dory, their mom. Um, this nest is definitely getting a little bit crowded. I like to see all the vibrant beard lichens of Midcoast Maine in the nest with these cutie pies. Um, as I mentioned, it was super cool to see all three of them fledge. Um, we didn't have quite a successful season with the additional osprey nest that's actually on Hog Island. Um, since 2012 until 2021, there was a pair of ospreys who was nesting on camera. Um, this gorgeous fella up here is Steve, named for Dr. Stephen Kress, the founder of Project Puffin. Um, he had a longtime mate named Rachel, who's named for Rachel Carson, um, and they were beloved by cam viewers. Uh, the osprey nest has a very strong following of folks who don't just watch this osprey nest or these osprey nests at Hog Island, but watch osprey nests on explore.org all up and down the East Coast. Um, there's another camera that's really active in the Chesapeake. Viewers will share information about multiple nests, will share highlights from the nest, um, which I think is a testament to how these cameras foster a love of not just these individual birds, which it is remarkable to think about the same birds returning to these nests after going all the way down to South and Central America, but a love for the species in general and a love for all birds. Um, but this is Steve here. Um, in 2022, Rachel, his mate, did not return in 2021, and he had um, another bird that he was nesting with who viewers had nicknamed Callie because she had this beautiful, distinctive calico pattern. Um, but this photo was taken by a friend of Hog Island, Kathy Lena, um, showcasing Steve with a new bird that he had made a new nest with, um, regrettably for cam viewers, but good for Steve, just slightly off camera on the island's long cove overlooking the shell midden for those who are familiar with the the island. Um, but as I mentioned, even when there isn't such a successful season on camera for the nest, like this year Steve didn't use his on-camera nest, um, the cameras can still capture all types of cool things. In 2017, the cameras captured this little cutie. This is Maine's first verified vermilion flycatcher. Um, the cameras are super high definition. It's super cool to get this look at who's passing through when the seabirds leave their nesting islands in the fall. Cam viewers get to enjoy a bunch of migratory species who pass through raptors and all types of cool birds. Um, for those who are following the cams right now, there is currently an eagle who's been capturing quite a bit of attention on the seal cam because when those cameras um, are no longer observing seabirds, the cameras on Seal Island display a seal colony that pops on the island. So it's a really cool way not just to look um, at the specific birds that we're interested in, but also all of Maine's awesome wildlife for people who wouldn't regularly be able to access it. Um, I also think that these cameras can inspire people to become scientists themselves, um, especially for young people. Um, these cameras for the Seaward Institute provide a really cool online avenue to boost the research work that's being done and the educational work that's being done by staff. Um, this is Abigail Muscat. She is a Mainer. She grew up here. She attended Hog Island sessions when she was young. And then she was actually a volunteer moderator with the cameras as a teenager um, this past year. This is her in 2022. She was a research assistant for three and a half months on Outer Green Island. She was out there in her tent the whole time, um, hanging out with these cool seabirds. These are some Gillamot chicks that she pulled from her burrow. The term for that is grubbing, which is so fun. <laughs> um, but I think that it's 
not an isolated incident that Abigail fostered such a strong connection with the birds through Explore.org and through Hog Island, um, and that contributed to her journey as a super researcher and a scientist. She's such a pleasure to work with. It was awesome to learn from her this past summer. It's a really good pivot to the cameras on Seal Island National Wildlife Refuge. Um, as I mentioned, there's five total cameras on this island. There's three external views of the island and then two additional looks into really cool seabird burrows where these guys are having their little ones and raising them, feeding them. Um, and then we get to observe all of that in a non-invasive way with these high definition cameras. But for our researchers, um, they're sitting in what's called bird blinds, these wooden boxes that I'll show some pictures of in a moment. Um, and they're looking out with their scopes, trying to look at these guys for up to eight hours a day, and two four hour shifts. And that's what all these birds are here, power return and raise though. These are like the observation blinds that the researchers are doing their observations from. Um, and then these are the cameras throughout the island. This camera is the most popular one that we would use at the visitor center on the big screen all the time to engage with folks um, about what's going on on the island. This camera is called the loafing ledge on Seal Island. This puffin right in front is really showcasing why it's called the loafing ledge. He's loafing, he's lounging, he's enjoying the summer sunshine. <laughs> um, and then amidst all of these Atlantic puffins, there's also some razor bills on top of the rock here. There is a ton of really cool seabirds who nest on seal during the summer months, um, not just puffins. I think that puffins can serve as a really cool seabird ambassador in that way, because um, they're super quirky and they're super fun to watch. They're kind of goofy looking the way that they waddle. They've got those beautiful bright colors. Um, and I think folks immediately latch onto them, um, but I think they serve as kind of a gateway to other really awesome seabirds um, and birds in general. And then you can see also there's a mer decoy here. Um, and we would show this view on the big screen at the visitor center. It was such a cool way for us to talk about social attraction, um, which is the tool that was used to restore the seabirds to these awesome islands um, and to talk about the conservation work that the project has pioneered and continues on to this day. This is another look at the cameras um, from the outside. You can see they don't, um, like bother the birds per se. Um, they will just climb right on them like they're a rock, like they're part of their natural environment. That's at least the hope that it's as non-invasive as possible. Um, there's some puffin decoys down there in the bottom left corner as well, and they're looking very crisp. Um, and we'll be hearing more from Sue at the end of this presentation about the uses that these decoys have and all the awesome ways they've served conservation work. This is called the Borough Exterior, another look at Seal Island. Um, these red numbers on the rocks each mark an Atlantic Puffin Borough that researchers on Seal Island are tracking. This past summer in 2022, um, researchers actually found the 900th borough on Seal Island. Um, and all those boroughs might not be active at one time, but they have been active at some point over the past 50 years during the project's monitoring. Um, and this, Buoy down here in the grass is actually the most special, most famous Atlantic Puffin Burrow and Seal, um, because that is where this camera displays Willie and Millie's burrow. Willie and Millie are the on-camera puffin pair on explore.org. Um, every single year, they raise a puffling in the burrow. Um, like Flo, who you can see here, um, she's getting preened by one of her parents. Um, puffins typically mate for life. Our explore.org puffin pair um, has had some telenovela as romance drama before. They were actually part of a puffin love triangle, um, which I shared with Dr. Stephen Kress that that was my interpretation of what happened. He told me that that was anthropomorphizing a bit, but I think that it's um, definitely like one way that we connect through the cameras with these birds is that we experience their behaviors um, and their life cycles and like we project our human emotions onto them for sure. But I think it's because we go through the same struggles. Um, when the puffins who are very social have social dynamics, um, we see ourselves in that. When they have sibling rivalry, the guillemots and the puffins, I think we see ourselves in that too. Um, and these themes that the birds struggle with like hunger um, and survival are definitely true to us as well. This is another look at Flo, um, the on-camera puffling. This is when she's um, a little less 
puffy and fluffy as she was looking in her down feathers in the last clip. She's rocking more of an Albert Einstein look here. Um, and she's freshly adorned with these ankle bands that researchers will be using to recite her in the future. Puffins will spend the first couple of years of their life at sea and then return to the same island that they fledged from. Um, but she won't do that for several many years. Um, and when she does, that's how we'll know it's her. Um, this is a picture of Florence Miriam Bailey, the human, who she was named after. She was a trailblazing ornithologist um, and activist at a time when women were severely underrepresented in the field. Um, this is a drawing of a belted kingfisher that she did. And there's a quote about this guy in her 1889 book, Birds Through an Opera Glass, that I thought was very fitting um, for tonight's topic about bird life cams and how we use these cameras to tap into the bird's secret worlds. Um, but she said about birds that they are adventurers and that ask him for his compass. He needs no trail, follow him and he will teach you the secrets of the forest. I think that's so true, especially about our birds. Maybe not the forest in this case, but the coast um, and the sea. So this is a look at um, one of the puffer parents bringing in some fish to their puffling in the burrow. Um, one of the most important pieces of data, as I mentioned, that our researchers are looking for out on the islands is the prey availability for these seabirds. Um, puffins and other seabirds eat exclusively fish, um, and that's what's making their conditions um, ever increasingly difficult. As time goes on, the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world, and so the types of fish and the amount of fish that's available here is changing. That's a huge threat to puffins um, who feed their babies whole tiny fish when the fish are larger, which is um, typical for warmer water fish, like the Atlantic butterfish is kind of like the mascot for this problem um, for Project Puffin. The baby puffins aren't able to swallow those fish, and so they're found in the burrow, um, starved or surrounded by fish that they couldn't fit down their mouths. Um, my colleague Arden, who I mentioned earlier, was doing um, really interesting work at McGill with cameras on burrows. She was using cameras that didn't record videos like these ones on explore.org, but that would take a rapid series of photographs triggered by motion. So when puffins would come to feed their little ones in the burrow, all these photos would be captured of what kinds of fish were in their bill. And then researchers would go in and look and try to assess how many fish, what kind of fish are these birds bringing in, and then pair that information with data from geotags on the birds' ankles so they can see where in the water the birds are foraging and how much they're pulling out of the water. That type of data is super, super important for informing fisheries on adaptive management techniques and then also for governments to determine where in the water it might be valuable to put things like sea monuments or other protections. Um, and that's something that Project Puffin is super concerned about as well. Um, and it's something I know that Don talked about in his um, lecture about offshore wind. Um, another type of behavior that scientists are looking at that our CAM viewers are also able to observe um, is reciting. And this is the process, like I mentioned, when Flo comes back to the island one day, she'll have those gorgeous little bracelets on telling her or telling us that it's her. Um, our CAM fans, because these cameras are so high definition um, and so high quality, are often able to recite the birds on camera on the loping ledge or the burrow exterior. This is a screenshot that was taken by a CAM viewer this past season in 2022. Um, and this is Grace. This one is the puffling that was born on camera in 2018 um, and successfully fledged many years ago from William Millie's burrow. Um, when this kind of information is captured by CAM viewers, it gets recorded and entered by researchers into the real database, or not like the real database, but the database that is used at Project Puffin. Um, so it's not just community science, it's community scientists bolstering the science that Project Puffin is facilitating. Um, and Coco, the island supervisor, last year on Seal Island was a huge fan of the cams um, and would look at the chat boards often to see what people were saying or to see if there were issues with the cameras with the view being obscured. Um, and it was also a really cool way to find out like that flow had fledged, for example, or that only one of the Guillemot eggs hatched. Which brings me to the Guillemot camera. This is the final um, live camera that's hosted on explore.org, showcasing the Seabird Institute's birds. Um, this on the left here, this handsome, bespeckled fella is Pax. 
Pax um, was the chick that was raised on camera this year in the Guillemot burrow, which is displayed on the right. Guillemots like puffins will nest in these rocky burrows. Um, but as many researchers at the project of this cert, they're kind of an underappreciated alcid, which is the family that puffins and guillemots belong to. Um, they're the closest relative to a puffin, but they don't get quite as much fame um, or attention. That being said, we have a very small but devoted group that follows the guillemot camera. And so amongst themselves, they decided to name Pax um, last year, which is Latin for peace. But I wanted to show, um, well, this is Pax, first of all, as an egg before he came into the world. Um, and one of his guillemot parents, guillemots have a lot of personality, um, just like their other Allison counterparts, like puffins, and they're super fun to watch. Um, but they nest in these little rocky crevices, and so it can be kind of difficult to get a good view of them. Um, you can see how cozy this little guy is in between those boulders. They've got very fun Twizzler-like bright red legs, and then a gorgeous mouth to match inside. Um, this is what the Guillemot burrows look like from the outside. Um, these are pictures that I took when I spent some time with the crew on Seal Island last summer. Um, the process of doing a productivity check for these seabirds, or as the researchers would call it, doing prod, is when they look into the burrows with little flashlights um, and they record how many adult birds or chicks or eggs are present in the burrow at one time. Um, Seal has Seal Island has a rock structure in the middle of it called the spine, um, and that's where the guillemots do their thing. Um, and so it's definitely a rough and tough process. Uh, I wanted to include these shots because they're so fun to look at, but also just to highlight um, how hard it is to get a good look at what these guys are up to. And so how remarkable it is that these cameras can provide us high definition views of their behaviors all the time um, and why it's so cool for the researchers to have this window into their world as well. Um, this is another look at a day in the life of a steward researcher. This is Amanda McFarland, one of the research assistants from Seal Island this past season. Um, these are some of those blinds I was talking about, these wind boxes. Scientists will sit in up to eight hours a day on a bucket, just looking out to see you, the sea and your scope and all these gorgeous birds to talk to. Um, there are a lot of really cool ways to keep up with what's going on at Project Puffin and the Seabird Institute throughout the summer. Um, and if you're interested in seeing images like this or getting a closer look into the world of our seabird scientists, I would definitely recommend checking out the Seabird Island News, which is a weekly newsletter that goes out all summer long, highlighting what's happening on each island, and then also providing updates on explore.org and what's going on on the cameras. As I have been mentioning, I think that um, birds like puffins or ospreys can immediately gain um, a really powerful following. A lot of people really like raptors. A lot of people really like puffins. Um, these are bigger birds that are um, easily recognizable. Um, but I think that puffins are a cool ambassador. I think they get people hooked on seabirds. And then with an island like Seal Island um, that has so many different species of seabirds nesting on it, these cameras provide all different types of views into all different types of birds and hopefully get people interested in not just puffins, but seabirds and birds as a whole. This is a common tern chick. Seal is home to two different species of terns during the summertime. Um, and this little guy is testing out his wings, getting ready to fledge on a windy summer day. Um, when people would come in to the visitor center, um, they would often be really knowledgeable about puffins, but not so much our other seabirds. And I think that these cameras and these cam operators work remotely all around the world, and then use these high definition lenses to zoom in on how things like the vermilion flycatcher or the turns around the puffin burrows um, can really highlight all of these diverse and amazing species. These cameras are also a really cool educational tool, not just at places like the visitor center, but in traditional classrooms. These are some pictures from a third grade science classroom at Camden Rockport Elementary School. Um, this is one of the schools that I'm working with um, at my current role at Coastal Mountains Land Trust as an AmeriCorps member. Um, 
the teacher there, Robin, is using the Eagle Cam in Decora, Iowa to bolster her life cycle curriculum for her students. Um, on the left here, you can see a list of questions that she's having her students answer about bird life cycles based on what they're observing on the cameras that are projected onto a big screen in their classroom. And then on the right, there's some worksheets that she's been having them fill out, um, tracking the life cycles of these birds. We have eagles here in Maine. Um, there are no eagle cameras on explore.org. Um, so it's a really cool way for the kids to watch in real time the life cycles of these birds, um, learn about their behaviors, and then hopefully go out into the world, um, go out into their own backyards in Maine with these eagles and have a better understanding of what's happening in their nest, um, which would otherwise be inaccessible if we didn't have these cool views. Also, <laughs> Robin has made me aware that she plans to put on the puppy cameras when they go live in Maine. Um, I think that's super cool, but I just think it's awesome to get the kids involved with the cameras in any way. Because when I was at the visitor center, um, kiddos would love to come in and watch what was going on on the camera. These are pictures from this past summer of the Project Puffin Visitor Center, which is a really cool avenue um, that the project and the Seabird Institute uses for outreach for the cams. We would display the cameras on two different screens right when you walk into the visitor center in Rockland. There's a TV screen up front, um, and then there's this big, beautiful screen projected in the back. Um, this is my favorite room, maybe in the world, because um, it's got so many cool things in it, as you can see. There is this miniature blind on the left side. We would do observation games um, with younger visitors. In Rockland, we would teach kids how to identify different species of seabirds. They get to learn um, how to count the birds um, and they get walked through a little feeding study as well. They get to learn how to identify different types of fish. Um, We've also got some really cool decoys on display um, and some really cool artifacts from the project's history. Well worth a stop in, well worth planning your whole trip around, I feel. Um, but that's the beauty of the cameras too, is that people get to come in and learn about the birds and then they can check in on the birds anytime from home. Explore.org is facilitating a lot of research um, into the effects that these cameras can have on people and whether or not that these cameras motivate people to participate in conservation work. Um, and there is research that they found that suggests that having virtual experiences with wildlife can be just as significant as having a face-to-face -face physical experience for someone in terms of motivating them to participate um, in environmental advocacy or conservation work in their community. Super cool. Um, on the left is Dr. Stephen Crest giving one of our Wednesday night lectures this past summer, um, talking about the project's history. And then um, that's one, our sandwich board when Arden and I gave our presentation on her research at McGill on feeding studies um, and my work with outreach for these cameras. As I mentioned, if you're interested in keeping up with the cams, it's really cool to watch on explore.org. And if you want more insider information on what's going on in the research sides of things on the islands, you can subscribe to the Secret Island News. There's also the Hog Island Happenings, um, which is a newsletter that goes out about camp goings on um, and the osprey nest. You can find all of those at uh, projectpuffman.audubon.org slash news. There's a lot of really cool stuff on there, including the egg rock update, which is an annual update capturing all the good stuff going on at the Seward Institute. I thought this would be a fun clip to close with because this is Flo, um, the on-camera puffling from this past season in her final moments on Seal Island before she fledged and took her first flight over Penobscot Bay. Um, there's her in dark and night vision. Um, it's also cool to see like how high depth the cameras are at night. I would always say that when it was nighttime and I checked in on the cameras and the turns are all lined up on those rocks, they kind of look like little bandits with that black mask. Um, but it could be bittersweet to see the birds go, but it was such a successful season this year. Um, and the researchers and the scientists at the project and all the staff at the Seabird Institute worked so hard to support these birds that it's just awesome to celebrate in them beginning their next uh, life cycle. And hopefully we'll see all the birds again one day when they return on explore.org. I'll let her take her flight. We can see her fly out. She's gorgeous. <laughs> yep. And that's it for me.
Great. Thank you so much, Maeve. That was a really great presentation. And I think um, you covered all the CAMs that we have, which is really exciting. Um, I was going to mention for folks at home that there is another one other Audubon CAM that they can turn into, and it's in Nebraska. And it is our Sand Hill Crane camera run by National Audubon Society's Rose Sanctuary. Uh, and it is live right now. So um, I just wanted to mention that because they're the only other person kind of like in the larger Audubon network that has live cams. And then we have our whole uh, uh, repertoire that you've gone through tonight. Um, but they can find those on explore.org as well, the, the crane cameras. Um, so if you have questions for Maeve, we are going to do a live Q&A here in just a little bit. Um, so feel free to drop your questions down in the comments section or the chat. Um, we'll get to you in just a minute. But first, we have our Audubon Bird Connection presentation. Uh, let me find her. The one and only Seabird Sue Shubel. Let's see where she is in my list of folks here. Uh, Sue is... Um, Joining us from the Audubon Decoy Workshop, um, Sue wears many hats at the Seabird Institute. Uh, she and has worn other hats too. That pretty much she's done everything uh, you can think of at the Seabird Institute um, during the main field season. She is the Assistant Sanctuary Manager. She provides logistical support to the island researchers on our seven Seabird Islands. Uh, she's also an instructor at our Hog Island Service Week called Birds of Maine Islands. Um, Maeve mentioned it earlier. That was the week that we built the Osprey Cam on top of the boathouse. Uh, it's a wonderful week where you can work alongside uh, our seabird researchers and support that conservation work directly. I'll put a chat, a link in the chat for you uh, about that. Uh, but tonight we're going to hear about uh, what Sue is up to in the off season when she's not working directly with seabirds um, out on the islands. Sue, take it away. Thanks, Eva. <clears throat> well, you can see I'm here in the decoy shop. So even when it's off season, I feel like I'm surrounded by birds. It's very comforting. It was great to see Maeve's presentation where she showed all those great clips and um, really brought uh, to the fore that those cams are so valuable for us learning about the behavior of birds. <clears throat> because when we want to help birds, we really do need to understand what they're doing. And Maeve, I'm with you. I think they do have emotions. Uh, humans have not cornered the market on that. Anthropomorphism is a species-ocentric term. Anyway, um, we're here and you could see on her clips how very social most seabirds are. So they nest in very few places. They come together from the wide expanses of the ocean to these small islands, typically, because that is what, like a halfway house for seabirds. The sea is their home. They need to come to land to lay an egg. Um, people have used decoys to influence the behavior of birds for a long time, typically to bring them into the barrel of a gun so that they can be hunted. <clears throat> but um, our project was the start of communicating with birds in order to help them. So these social birds use social clues to come together <clears throat> to uh, find these little tiny islands, using the clues that there are birds there hearing the birds, seeing the birds, helps them know that that is a safe place to be. So we're communicating with the birds about safe places to be. Uh, we got this company, the uh, Mad River Decoy Company was gifted to us in 2017. And we <clears throat> they've been making conservation decoys for quite a while. Uh, Jim Henry and his wife, uh, they developed this method. Um, he used to make canoes in Vermont. Mad River Canoe was his company. And so he would make this roto-molded roto plastic canoes. And using that technology, he developed these lightweight, hollow, roto-molded plastic decoys. Uh, you know, any kind of do decoy can work. It doesn't even have to be an exact replica of the bird. It can be a very simple essence of bird kind of shape. As long as you get the basic colors right, birds are smart. They have good eyesight. 
they can look at something and understand the symbolic nature of it. So the same way that we could look at a stick figure on a sign and know that that was a person walking, they can see you know, a bird-like shape with the basic color palette in place and they can think that is a bird. These people are trying to tell me something. So we have about, uh, let's see, I think we have 17 different kinds of molds. And from those molds, we have made at least 48 different species of birds. So we can use some of our more basic molds, <clears throat> like, uh, now I don't even have my common turn on me. We have a mid-sized turn, which can be used for many species. This is our mid-sized turn painted as a roseate, but it can serve for many, many different species of turns. Turns are extremely social, very sensitive to peer pressure, and biologically, they, they are prone to getting up as a flock and finding a new place to live if the place they are is not proving successful. Maybe there's not food there, maybe there are predators, maybe the habitat has suffered somehow. <clears throat> so. Turns are really, really influenced by seeing uh, a new site that we're telling them is a safe place. Our, de our projects that we supply decoys to are typically kind of you generally in three categories. So there are restoration projects where birds are being returned to a place where they used to be. For some reason, often people induce problems the place has been, uh, the population has been eliminated and now we're bringing them back because there is still intact habitat and perhaps uh, we needed to do some work there, but the habitat is ready to receive birds again. <clears throat> Eastern Egg Rock, the first restored seabird colony where puffins came back 50 years ago. Um, well, where we started bringing puffins back 50 years ago, that is a restoration project. <clears throat> we also involved in a lot of projects that are relocation projects. So if their first colony site is defunct, unable to be um, supporting birds, <clears throat> often um, birds are relocated to a new safe place. So we, with lease turns, we see this a lot. Their habitat gets destroyed or perhaps it's being used for something else. Uh, people want to put wind power in or their habitat has washed away with high storms, something like that. But if alternate habitat is available, birds can be relocated, convinced to relocate using these social cues. And then there are also projects um, to just comfort birds, give them confidence. Sometimes they need the confidence to land in a spot. Sometimes birds are used to uh, comfort ones that are being held in rehab or chicks that want to be surrounded by birds instead of just people like albatrosses. We often see decoys used to comfort albatrosses that are being raised by hand. Uh, so I wanted to show you a few more decoys. Oh, we also sometimes use uh, the, these are sent to projects where they're trying to do scientific research and they want to capture a bird. Uh, shorebirds aren't typical oyster catchers. Will, this is a willet. Uh, they are not so much nesting colonially, but they are very territorial. So they're attracted to decoys often to defend their territory. And we have had a number of projects where oyster catcher decoys and willets have been used to draw in birds so that they can be tagged and then tracked for scientific purposes or captured because they needed to have a band removed or helped in some way. I just uh, had a really interesting project where we made some marbled merlet decoys. Now you would think, why would you be making decoys for these tiny seabirds that nest high in old growth forest and they come in and out at night but these are actually to help the researchers train to spot birds up in the trees. So they would mount these so that the people could learn how to spot them. One of our decoys we have is a small gull type shape. 
which sometimes we can modify to be a petrel by carving the beak and painting it a different way. So we've created a lot of different decoys. We're very, very pleased to be able to send them out all over the world. I gotta say that is a thrill when I send a box off to Sweden or the Netherlands or Australia. Mauritius was a very exciting one. Um, I just love sending these birds out to do their important work out in the field. And we just hope for the best. Uh, another important aspect of the social attraction is not only the sights of an active colony, but also the sounds. And um, for a long time, I've been supplying solar powered sound systems to different projects around the world. And now people can one stop shop here and order their decoys and their sound systems. And then mirror boxes for active engagement, all these things together on a really nice, safe habitat, this is what we can do. You know, we can't solve all the world's problems, but when we're working with seabirds, we wanna do what we can do. We can create good habitat. We can create a faux colony to show them it's a safe place. We might, might not be able to keep them safe on every part of their long migration journey, but we do what we can do. I think that we can open it up to questions now. I'll give you a gannet and a parting shot. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Sue, for giving people some behind the scenes there. Um, remember, we are going to take questions from the chat, from the comment section, um, and kind of popcorn back and forth. Um, my first question, this is uh, for both of you. Um, young career naturalist wants to know, how did you get involved working with seabirds? Um, why don't we start with Sue and then we'll go to Maeve. Oh, how did I get involved? Um, well, I in co actually in high school, I did see Steve Chris on Wild Kingdom, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And at the time I thought, that's what I want to do. People were steering me. They thought, oh, you like animals. You should be a veterinarian. But I, I saw people out there on the wild islands of Newfoundland, and I thought, no, that is what I want to do. Uh, and then I went to school at the University of New Hampshire, and my ornithology professor, he basically grew up at Hog Island, so he gave me an inroad to that spot. Um, my first job working with seabirds was this job last summer. Um, I've always been a lifelong bird lover and bird appreciator, but I always thought that not being a hard scientist myself, my academic background is in like political science and environmental policy, but identifying birds and their songs was just way beyond me. Um, but the staff at the Seabird Institute, all the researchers I got to work with last summer, all the educators I got to work with, um, equipped me with the tools to be a birder today. And I think that the live cameras and having that really close up look into the birds and their behavior just made me fall in love with them even more. And now I'm running into Sue at Lincolnville Beach, looking at the ducks. <laughs> so, uh, And I think that's a good point, Maeve. Um, a lot of times folks think that you have to be, you have to have a science background or, you know, be into ornithology, but you can work with birds uh, as a science communicator, as an educator. There's all different paths uh, to do conservation work, policy, um, you name it, um, IT, tech. There's there's jobs out there um, for all types of people and their skill sets, uh, but you can still do it for things like bird conservation. Um, thanks, both. Our next question is for Maeve. Um, I'll preface this with my own. They often say you're not supposed to have a favorite child. Do you have a favorite bird cam that <laughs> you just had a little bit more of an inkling toward than the others? No. I don't know. One time I asked Sue what her favorite island was of all the islands, and she <laughs> wouldn't tell me. And I feel like I was like, I don't believe that. And now maybe I understand because I don't know if I could pick. I don't know. Seal is such a special place, um, but so is Hog Island. And it's so cool to have that window into both places. And I'm so glad that I can go back and check on them anytime I want to. <laughs> nice. Um, P, 
Pamela has a question. She wants to know, is there a repository for the data that's coming out of our live bird cams, this kind of intimate look that researchers are getting? Are we uh, cataloging that somewhere? Regina, who's a very avid viewer of the Hog Island cams, has been keeping a database um, about observations that she's made about the ospreys, like when they return each year and then when the eggs hatch um, and other significant moments. Um, I know that several, many viewers keep their own logs um, of their own feeding studies that they're doing with the birds. They mark down how many times a day the puffins in the burrow are getting fed and the ospreys as well and what types of fish they're bringing in. A lot of times when I would um, be, we would do like a weekly live stream every week last summer of one of the nests or the burrows, like cam viewers can identify what types of fish are coming in like super fast, um, they're super skilled. So I think people are keeping their own, I don't think we have a database. So any, any feedback there from the researcher perspective? Um, I don't know that we have, I don't know. We always talk about capturing better the observations from the loyal cam viewers because they are on there all the time and it's really super valuable. Uh, uh, but I don't think we have an official avenue for inputting yet. Great. Future project for someone out there um, who wants to join us and compile data. Um, I, I could see it proving very useful. All right, our next question is, um, well, there's a couple of questions here about decoys, so I'll, I'll give you those, Sue. Uh, first, Pamela asks if we've worked on any penguin projects, any penguin decoys? Hmm, we have not done any penguins yet. That would be thrilling. Uh, we don't have any penguin decoys, but we would definitely make one. <clears throat> All right, penguin researchers out there, you've heard it. You can contact <laughs> Sue. <laughs> uh, the next question about decoys is, uh, what's the rarest bird that you've like painted or made in the workshop? The rarest bird, probably the Chinese crested tern, which was thought to be extinct. And they, they nested just here and there in big colonies of greater crested terns. And so the thought was if they could be socially attracted to be in one place, they would be better able to find a mate, better able to be protected. And no one really knew if there were even any left, uh, but a few were found and they were drawn in, in larger numbers to um, an island in, off the coast of China. And now there've been a few found in South Korea also. So we we get to supply decoys to that project. Uh, we're very lucky tonight. We have Dr. Steve Kress joining us as a, uh, as a participant tuning in. And he wrote in the chat that Willie and Millie were the subject of a five-year study presented at the Pacific Seabird Group this past summer. So uh, there you go. Some people are compiling the data. It's great to know that's going to help um, seabird conservation. All right, our next question is, um, what species are you working on this year, Sue? Uh, you showed a couple uh, of decoys that you that you held up for the camera there. Um, any interesting projects that you're working on? Uh, let's see. Um, well, the marble merlets were really interesting because we didn't have a decoy this shape. So we had to make it out of a guillemot body. <laughs> and then we cut that off and we put in a modified turn head. So that was a big challenge. We also had a challenge. Uh, this was a bird that actually we started on this one last year, an Audouin's gull, which is uh, from the Mediterranean. And uh, this one we had to make out of a Caspian turn body and a, uh, which head did we use? I think we used, we used a different head that we, we physically uh, put into this bird. This was so interesting because this was going to the northern part of the island of Cyprus, which, uh, you know, birds do not understand political borders. And it was just a nightmare to get it there. It went, got trapped in Turkey and threatened with beheading. And uh, finally, finally, we sent it through through the UK, <clears throat> and they were hand carried to the northern part of Cyprus. 
Uh, but aside from that, let's see, we sent some sandwich turns. We sent a bunch of decoys to Sweden, which uh, is really pleasing. And now there are some black turns going to Texas tomorrow. Great. Wow. What an international presence and, and also here in the U.S. Um, Maeve, you mentioned that the Black Guillemot Cam has like a lower number of viewers, but uh, Laurel followers. Um, any reasons, any tidbits you would, if you had to do a 30-second pitch, why should people watch the Black Guillemot Cam? <laughs> What's your answer? <laughs> They're so funny. They're so full of personality. They're so quirky. I think there's a lot of like sibling drama that goes on when there's multiple Guillemots in a burrow at one time. I knew that there was an issue last season with like Guillemot siblings suspected violence on camera, which maybe isn't the best for this pitch, but it's still exciting to watch the family dynamics at play. I also know that a lot of the researchers think that there should be like cameras displaying the cormorant colony or perhaps like petrols. I know there's other petrol cameras throughout the world. Um, I think there's a lot of seabirds, seabird spotlights to be shown on Seal Island in the future and across the world. Uh, so you got any? Um pitches out there for the Guillemot lovers? Well, we do celebrate Guillemot Appreciation Day each year, June 27th, International Guillemot Appreciation Day, so celebrating all the Cephas Guillemots, not in, in the UK, they call the, what we call the common mer, they call the Guillemot, but we're talking the ones in the genus Cephas, the black, the pigeon, the, um, manse the spectacle uh and we celebrate them artistically and culinarily <laughs> and there's there's a lot of songwriting and interpretive dance involved there's even a facebook group out there if you want to join it um and people share all their creations of celebration which uh, and at hog island camp we actually observe it two different weeks, observe week and actual week, because we love Guillemots so much. Um, our next question is from Katrina over on Facebook. She says, um, how about songbirds? Have we done any um, songbird decoys? Uh, not decoys so much, although I was at Home Depot. They have purple martin decoys <laughs> at Home Depot. And I ordered one up and they said, are you trying to frighten the mosquitoes away? Uh, but I just wanted to see what the deal was with that. But we do have um, some people talking to me about sound systems for bobolinks and sound systems for purple martins. I have made sound systems for them in the past. And I have heard that purple martin decoys have worked. Um, I've used them when we were setting up new colonies in Florida um, for scouts, just to kind of be like, yes, this new um condo that we put up for the martins is attractive so just to get them interested i don't know how well it works but um it doesn't deter them for sure no, uh, i think it's good and i think that's why home depot is selling them which it was surprising to me um but i thought it was funny that they thought it was for scaring mosquitoes <laughs> <laughs> our next question is from sean he asks uh is there a bird species that you identify with sue do you want to take that one first oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that i identify with um during the pandemic when i was enjoying the birds around my home i was identifying with the brown creeper <laughs> However, I do trees. appreciate the puff. <laughs> I do appreciate the puff, and um, just because they do have a great sense of humor, they are very, very funny. And um, <laughs> Anthony Hill reminds me that if you take the first two letters of your first name and the first two letters of your last name, you can get your bird code as designated by uh, I think it's the AOU list. And mine is the surf scoter. <laughs> That's a good because you are at sea. That's a good one for you. That's good. I think. <laughs> um, I think I really identify with any of the little shorebirds, like the chunky plovers or sandpipers, when they're like running away from the waves, but they want to be there so bad. And they just <laughs> look very um, timid and also like high energy at the same time. I really like their chunky little bodies. So 
Uh, I always tell folks at Hog Island that I identify with the red-breasted nuthatch because they often are in a mixed flock. They make lots of noise and they're constantly moving. That's how I feel when I'm at camp all summer. Um, and uh, yeah, love. And I used to live in Colorado and it was one of the few birds that was at my feeder, both in Maine and in Colorado. So it, it felt like home to me. Um, well, I think we've gotten to most of the questions out there. Um, I really appreciate you both joining us tonight. I always like for people to share just some parting. Um, it could be advice. It could be like what you're hopeful about, um, especially when it comes to seabirds or bird conservation. Um, maybe it's a pitch for, you know, a way for people to get involved. So any parting words for the folks tuning in? Um, I'll start with Sue. I was hoping you'd start with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's see. Well, I think just pay attention. Uh, learn what you can. You can learn about things anytime. And that information, you can put it all in your hopper and, and then take some positive action for wildlife. I think I would also say pay attention. I think that birding is like an exercise in stopping and taking notice in general. There's that really good Mary Oliver quote where she says that once you notice something, it leads you to notice more and more, which I feel about birds in general and then kind of the natural world as a whole. Um, and I think that it's also just really impactful to be an ambassador for the birds just with your friends and your family and anyone that you encounter. I think that when people see someone who's really passionate about something, um, makes them want to take action too. So just talking to folks about what you think. I appreciate that. My final pitch for those at home, if you're interested in adult bird camp, that's what we do at Hog Island. We still do have space in quite a few of our sessions, especially our September sessions. I tell folks that's the secret month of the year that I think is just the best in Maine, uh, best weather, wonderful birds. Um, a lot of the seabirds have lost it, have left, they've migrated off, but we do get our nice fall migration and beautiful sunsets. So if you're interested, you can go to hogisland.audubon.org. Um, Thank you, Maeve and Sue, for being here, lending your expertise. And everyone at home, um, we have one more Making Bird Connections lecture this season. It will be in two weeks uh, at 7.30 Eastern time on April 6th. We are so lucky. We're going to have Dr. Stephen Kress. Steve's going to be giving us a special presentation about the 50th anniversary of Project Puffin. Uh, super excited to honor uh, his legacy and this amazing conservation project. We'll also have an Audubon Connection speaker discussing the new Audubon Bird Explorer. If you haven't checked that out, we'll talk about that as well. And you can sign up uh, at hogisland.audubon.org. You can stream it live on Facebook. We're super excited that you're joining us. And remember, um, to think of us and drop a donation. The links are down in the comment section. Thank you all. Have a great night. <laughs>